Hello students, today we'll be talking about history and systems of psychology. Yay, the most fun topic. I'm sure you're all thrilled about taking this course, but we're trying to pay some homage and look back at our history, history to see where we get some of our common practices from, like behaviorism and um, some of the therapies that we perform. So allow me to just look at over some notes over here. That way we can cover uh, a nice breadth of philosophers and psychologists and we'll start in ancient Greece and then we'll probably we'll end somewhere around behaviorism okay with some people that you maybe learned about in your psych 101 classes we'll, we'll kick it off with Socrates uh, Socrates was a philosopher in ancient Greece I'm just gonna go real quick short and sweet bullet points that you might need to know for an exam he uh, emphasized, he was a rationalist and he was the, the why, why, why guy. Socrates was never satisfied with an answer. He always believed that there was another question to be asked and he doubted that any knowledge was, was permanent or could exist uh, perfectly. He always thought that there was, there was a better answer or something that could be uh, deduced further. Next we'll go, Socr uh, from Socrates we'll go to Plato, we'll move to Plato. So Plato was also a rationalist, and he was an idealist. Uh, he termed the, uh, the word psyche. So psyche could mean your spirit or your mind. Well, think about how back in the day, there was a very big debate between, um, between materialism and dualism. So this is an important concept that you all need to know inside and out. Dualism is believing that you have this mind and this body. This body is the flesh, the material, things that you can see, grab, touch, and then the mind, that's where the debate comes. Is the mind immaterial? It means that it comes from somewhere else, it comes from outside and just exists through the body, through actions, behavior, and you know you have your brain, you have your heart, where is your soul? So there was there's a lot of uh there's a lot of questions surrounding this. So the dualists would think that the mind and body can exist apart and when the body dies the body dies but if you were righteous and good and virtuous that your soul could live on uh, sort of sort of similar to some religions today whereas materialists thought that everything has to be um, materialized or attributed to some sort of uh, tangible thing so that your mind would live in the body and die with the body. Let me see what I wrote down for materialism. So materialism, there is not a material soul. The human person is only matter. So like I was saying, no immaterial soul or mind or abstract idea, just the, the material of the soul, the, the body. And then dualism, making sure I'm explaining it and giving you definitions. Oh no. Okay, we're going to introduce another idea coming up in addition to the dualism materialism But for now, let's move on to the next philosopher So we have Socrates, Plato, and before we leave Plato, super super important um, He did not believe in sense data He believed in just rationalism. Plato is the rationalist who similar to Socrates was questioning things asking questions to derive knowledge but using uh, rationale and reason Reason Plato, okay? He always has to find out for himself because he says that your senses can deceive you. Moving on to Aristotle. Aristotle was a student of Plato. However, he slightly changed his views and adopted some new ideas of his own that were in direct opposition to Plato in, in light of he was, um, he was an empiricist. So an empiricist would say that I need empirical data, meaning data that I gather from my surroundings, through my senses, and that's exact opposite of Plato. Plato wanted to reason to conclusions or to knowledge, to knowledge. And um, Aristotle wanted to use the things he had of it, his apparatuses available, meaning his senses. That's Aristotle, empiricist. Um, this is what I was talking about, the, the fork in the road, hylomorphism. So hylomorphism is this idea that the mind and body are interdependent and the soul depends on the body. So it's, it's a form of dualism. If that's how you want to remember it, that's the best way to remember it. That the mind and body are interdependent means the mind, mind will die with the body because it needs it. They're interdependent. 
but um, they're still separate. It's immaterial and material. Hylomorphism. Dualism, soul will live, body will die. Materialism, only that there's only the material, it dies. And hylomorphism, the little hybrid, more and more in the terms of dualism, is they need each other, but um, they die together. And they deteriorate together. Uh, uh, what I like about Aristotle is his view on virtue and ethics. So Aristotle believes in the golden mean. The golden mean is um, an idea of eudaimonia. You can look up eudaimonia. It's um, sort of an esoteric concept, but explained quite succinctly, I believe that eudaimonia is the, the uh, journey towards being good, being virtuous, and understanding that you need to have a mean, a golden mean, that is within your vices. So if you're faced with an, I guess, with a morally trying situation and you need to choose a course of action, most of us know the what we, what we want to do, just like the quick reaction, what we should do, and um, what we could do but don't really have the courage to. So there's there's some extremes going on when we're faced with decisions, um, virtuous decisions, all the way from something, let me put it in a concrete example, cowardice to courage. Say you see someone getting mugged and you want to help you, want to know if you should intervene. Well, Aristotle was very big on individual differences. Virtue is not a one size fits all. It's all about the golden mean for the individual, okay? So individual differences is what he takes into account. And he says your social supports will determine like kind of where you fall into the grand scheme of things. So for the example with a person getting mugged, are you maybe strong enough or capable enough to intervene physically? Or are you small and then it'll just put you both at, uh, in danger? Should you call the police? What should you actually do? Well, you should look within your your um, your vices and say, this is the absolute worst thing that I don't want to do. This is the best thing that I maybe shouldn't do. Don't be hasty or irrational, but don't be a coward either. Act within your capability of what you know is good. And that's the thing that people might not like about Aristotle is that it is a little foggy because it's so individualized, person to person, and it's not like a hard and fast rule. And we know good and virtuous by finding people in society that we think are good and virtuous and sort of mirroring how they handle situations and adapting it to our own lifestyle and finding what works best for us. Um, he believed that uh, detriments to mental health were <laughs> irrational thoughts like irrational ideas and um, bad habits and um, he believed that uh, freedom he believed in freedom of choice like I was talking about earlier but yeah limit limits to intellect and um, a bad understanding of the forms is what he believes are the main flaws to human intellect and if you don't know about the, the forms I should have touched on it with Plato but there's an ideal world that we should all emulate, but we can't ever really know it directly. We, we can only know it through our dreams, Plato would say. We get little glimpses of it because I remember our immaterial soul floats off and it, it lived in the world of the forms at one time. So it gives us these little mental images in our dreams and that's how we can experience it. That's how we should shape our behavior. That's what Plato would say on virtue, but we can't ever master that behavior. Aristotle would say that there is uh, an ideal thing that we should be doing. We should be emulating it, but we do have the freedom of choice and we need to act within our own means and we need to use our sense data and we have the hylomorphism. So we, we act on the form, but our body and, and soul will die together. Um, next, let's move to let's move down the timeline a little bit. Let's talk about the medieval period. Okay, so after these these guys in Greece, we'll, we're moving on to medieval times, where we have philosophers like Saint Augustine. Okay, so Saint Augustine was obviously a very religious person. Catholicism dominated the day, and since Catholicism was dominating, it kind of pushed scientific inquiry 
um, down because of religious dogma. Augustine described grief and habit breaking and infant motivation with memory developed distinction between recognition and recall uh, used today with many psychological topics. So for Augustine, I like to remember that he studied infant motivation. He thought infants were like brutish and selfish, sounding a little Hobbesy, right? But if you're an infant, then obviously you're going to be a little bit um, acting on the id to be a little Freudy. Uh, so Augustine studied that. And the main thing about him is that he had some confessions, okay? So Augustine's confessions put light on the fact that we have uh, we have dreams and they can be vivid and that sometimes we we want things that aren't virtuous and we need to replace those desires with uh, like a strict rebuke saying, hey, let's not do that. You need to reprimand yourself, control yourself and rechannel that energy into something more positive and more virtuous, which he found to be the Bible. What um, Augustine wanted to do, which is a major thing, I, I believe, is uh, pair, um, try to use religion, but also try to use reason and rationalism, saying that we shouldn't do this thing because it's bad, and let's rechannel our energy and do something else. Um, he he did a he had a distinction between recognition and recall. And that's pretty much all for Augustine. Let's move on to Thomas Aquinas. Um, actually. Oh, one more cool thing about Augustine. He said that when I die, everyone I know will die with me. He's talking about memory. So dreams, memory, babies for Augustine. Um, going on to Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas also in the same period, he brought Aristotle's work into the church. Um, emotion must be understood on the physiological and psychological. And he assumed a relationship between material experience and mental activity and personality meant wholeness and completeness. So for what I like to remember for Aquinas, since you're gonna have to remember all these people is that he throw it back to Aristotle. Aristotle in Greece, Aquinas in the medieval. Um, these are all A names, so that's going to be a little bit challenging, but um, Augustine and Aquinas are both very churchy you know, because of Catholicism, but um, Aquinas has similar ideas to Aristotle, um, just more religiously oriented. He believed in hylomorphism as well, where the, the dualist idea where the soul comes into the body and it's different, it's immaterial and comes into the material body. But then he, he also believed in empiricism as Aristotle did, meaning that you gain information about the world and about virtue through, about knowledge, about the world and knowledge through your senses because that's all you really have. Moving on, let's go to the Renaissance. Okay, so the Renaissance was important for a few reasons. It was the rebirth of scientific inquiry Okay, the, the reason that it re-sparked inquiry was because there was the Black Plague and then there were some challenges to, uh, I guess, the map the, and how the world was understood. There was a geocentric theory in the time of the Renaissance that was traditionally understood by because the, the Catholic Church provided most of the knowledge. So the geocentric theory said that humans are the center of the universe and that the world is flat and things uh, operate around our existence. It was later replaced by, um, I guess, more careful look at cosmology that brought the heliocentric theory, meaning that planets orbit and there's a sun, and there's other planets, and there's an earth, and we're all in this rotation, and that humans are not the, the center of being and existence. So science was really starting to undermine religion in the fact that religion is giving us these, these truths that aren't really so true especially with exploration, um, Copernicus's work, uh, Galileo's work, Da Vinci's work on anatomy, Galileo with improvements on the telescope, and Copernicus with ideas about the shape of the world. Uh, the plague, so many people were dying, even high religious people, the people in power. So if the people who are in direct communication with God and praying to end the plague are getting the plague and dying from it and can't stop it, 
then who's to say that they really know God and God's plan and can speak for him or for the God. Let's move on past the Renaissance. We already talked about some of the key players in there. And let's talk about Francis Bacon. So Francis Bacon is huge. He was the founder of empiricism, the father of empiricism. And because he's so empirical, we already talked about empiricism. And so it's using your senses and your observations to gain knowledge about the world. Bacon is attributed or credited with the invention of the scientific method. And he was an inductive thinker. He would use inductive arguments and inductive thinking in order to reason. And that's sort of where the scientific method was birthed because when we induce, we um, there's induction and deduction. I'm pretty sure you're familiar, but a quick uh, little recap and distinction is that when you induce and when you're using the inductive reasoning, you're thinking that uh, these premises and this conclusion, you, and you're trying to find the relationship between the premises and a conclusion. So there's this cute little example about Two people go into a husband store and they are told that as they climb each ladder of the store, there are like seven floors, that um, each level they go up, they'll be given a chance at getting a better husband. But they can only go into the store one time and this is it. And once they go up a level, they can't go back down and they only get one visit. So once they pick their husband, they're gone. So these two people go in, one's a proponent of the inductive reasoning and one from the deductive. So they go up the first floor, okay, job. Second floor, job loves kids. Third floor, job loves kids, play guitar. Fourth floor, and cooks. Fifth, you get the point, right? So say they reach the, the, fifth, the, the sixth floor, okay? Let's say they reach the sixth floor, and there's this long, amazing list of things, and the deductive person would be like, I'll take it. Even though there's seven floors, I'll take it. And that's because based off of all these premises of, I like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you know, from the seventh floor, from the sixth floor so far. Um, I think that this is what I want. So making a conclusion based off of uh, like um, the way things have been in the past. However, the person who is inductive wants to see conclusions before they make a premise. So they, they would conclude that, you know, the seventh floor is supposed to be the best and every floor gets better as we go up so it's true so far so i'm going to go to the seventh floor and get the best one so lady number six deductive goes down lady number seven goes up seventh floor and there's a note that says um th this floor uh, one million other people have visited this floor only to prove that women can never be satisfied. So it's just, it's a cute joke in the end, but uh, what it proves is that an inductive reasoning person would want to think that, let me witness some things and then work backwards. And a person with deduction would say, let me use what I've seen and some general ideas and make a conclusion forward. Uh, my, that was my attempt to make this clear, but I can see that I failed. <laughs> uh, let's move on. So Francis Bacon, uh, I'll come back to inductive and deductive a little bit later, but for the sake of time, think about, you can buy bacon if you visit the marketplace, right? Well, Bacon had some ideas about um, fallacies to human intellect, and he named the fallacies the four idols, right? So you can buy bacon in the marketplace, and one of the fallacies was the marketplace. The fallacy of the marketplace, he had fallacy of the tribe, fallacy of the cave, or idol of the cave, marketplace, tribe, and idol of the theater, okay? So these four. Start with the tribe. People look for simple answers, and they're usually satisfied with them. Um, that's the boundary to human intellect. So that's the idol of the tribe um, by... Francis Bacon. Second, we'll go idol of the the cave, okay? So think about a cave, it's kind of dark. So you're blinded to new alternatives because you have certain uh, prejudices or certain information that you've already accepted. So since you, since you know that information, you are kind of just stuck on 
on that rather than opening your eyes to new alternatives. You're blinded by prejudices and blinded by previous knowledge. Number three, idol of the marketplace. Idol of the marketplace says that once you name something, once you attach it, you think it's done. Like you think, hey, we already explored um, planetal orbit, orbit, right? So that's all there is to know about it. Like we get it. It's already named, been there, done that. So that's the idol of the marketplace because we already named it, put it on the shelf like the market, and now it's done. We don't need to explore it anymore. And then finally, idol of the theater. Idol of the theater means that people and fancy pants people sitting at the top of the theater, you know, they know everything. People in high power or of high status positions know everything. So if they say something that you don't really explore it because I guess their their logos, their their appeal of intelligence or status or power. Uh, Bacon, I know there was a lot to go over with him. Um, he studied sleep and dreams, development from infancy to old age, and makes sense since he's an empiricist. Um, he studied sight and hearing as well. Next, we'll move to John Locke. He was a materialist. So everyone you've been hearing about has been a an empiricist so far, thinking that um, thinking that things you can just view and that's how you gain knowledge. Locke was a materialist. Oh, materialism has to do with the mind-body problem, actually. Locke was also an empiricist. He believed that you could use your senses to gather knowledge, but the materialist has to do with the fact that he believes that you have this body, right? And it's so more scientific. Bacon, we didn't really explore his thoughts about the mind-body problem, but we know that Locke is a materialist. And he believed that the mind is the tabula rasa or the blank slate, meaning that people are born without any innate knowledge and they're not preloaded packages. So what does this imply? This implies that everything you gain through your senses, empiricism, is going to create kind of you and your morals, where you fall, your personality. Um, he attempts to describe human knowledge between the ideas of objects. So something important about him and his empiricism is that he categorized things into primary and secondary objects. Primary objects are objects or primary and secondary qualities. So an object right here, let's take this, uh, this mug for instance, beware this is my first cup. Anyways, the primary qualities are just the first basic qualities. It's hard, it's got this shape and um, that's pretty much it. Very basic, very um, objective. You can't really disagree with these because no matter who you are, you can say that it's this tall and it's uh, this shape. But let's say secondary qualities. So you can say this is black, you can say it's light gray, you can say this is silver gray, you can say this is smooth, you can say it's slick, you can say it's sleek, um, you can say it's whatever you want. It's tinted, it's clear. So secondary qualities are subjective person to person and they might have some variance in it. Uh, let's move on past Locke and go to George Berkeley. George Berkeley was a very sense, sense data person too. Um, George Berkeley was, just, just think about him like super, super sensory. So he's an empiricist and uh, studied, studied vision and hearing too. I don't think that was Bacon actually, it was Berkeley. And um, he brought back the importance of experiences and preached that all we know is through our senses. And yeah, um, let, me, let me grab a note on him. Idealism. Ideas are packed in, passive and we have an inactive mind. Okay. We are active beings, but we don't cause our ideas rather they are given to us. Our mind is immaterial substance or soul. Surely it would be crazy to blame that our wrong ideas exist in God's mind. Okay, that's a lot to unpack. So our mind is immaterial substance and that's, that's part of dualism, right? And we already know that. So Berkeley must be a dualist, okay? Um, but another form of dualism is idealism. I don't know how picky your professors are going to be. So he's an idealist. And um, he believed that the, the world had a continual perceiver. So this is the abstract and 
kind of keynote thing about Berkeley. So Berkeley is all about the senses and empiricism and gaining knowledge that way. And um, mainly about a continual perceiver. He says, to be is to be perceived. That's his famous one-liner for Berkeley. Meaning that my whole reality exists because I am perceiving it, because I'm seeing things, right? And that's what's giving me my reality. And that's what's giving you your reality. And everyone's going to have that to themselves. And um, people, critics of Berkeley would say, okay, so like, so you probably don't believe you, like, like, how do you ex even exist if you, um, if, if it's person to person, it's this concept where if, if your reality is the only one that exists and his reality is the only one that exists, then how do those people meet together and exist together, you know? So, so soloism is what it's called. So solism. Um, anyway, solism is an idea that refutes Berkeley saying, saying exactly what I just said. How do people even interact and create this collaborative world? Well, he didn't believe in solism. He said that, you know, that's interesting. Actually, the whole world does exist all together because um, it's, it's very continuous, right? We can predict things that are happening today, tomorrow, the next day, kind of acts in a uniform manner. It has this sort of, sort of continuity to it. And that's because things exist only when they're perceived. And it doesn't end when I die because God is perceiving everything and he's not going to die. So that's why the world goes on. And that's why my theory is still right because although I'm not perceiving anymore, God's still perceiving and that's why the world's gonna keep going. Um, yeah, but then a major critic or critique of Berkeley could be that, well, if, if God gives us these ideas and our perceptions and ability to interpret the world, then what about bad ideas? What about wrong? What about things that are not virtuous? Surely God wouldn't put an invirtuous idea or unvirtuous idea into your mind. So that's, that's where people are able to criticize George Berkeley. Let's see if there's anything else or if I can move past. Um, we'll move on. We'll move on to David Hume. David Hume was an empiricist, big surprise but he was also a skeptic. So he saw things and interpreted them, but he was also skeptical of them. He agreed with Berkeley that experience is primary, but he added that experience is a chain of events, causality and other relationships are only functions of mental habits. So what does that mean? So if I, if I drop these keys, super loud, right? But if I drop the keys, then is it my hand that dropped the keys? Or was it my decision to sit in this chair? So my legs that dropped the keys because my legs brought me to this chair? Or was it my knees because my knees bent me to sit down? Or was it me driving over here? Was my car the one that dropped the keys? You know, it's like, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it holds up to any logical sense. But what Hume is saying is that we tend to make these mental habits of saying that my hand dropped the keys because we're pairing two can, uh, two stimulus that happen con clo most closely together. So since my since I realize that when I let go of something it falls, I attribute letting go of something and the falling to be the relationship of causality. But Hume does not believe in causality. He doesn't even believe himself. He he does not believe in a sense of self or causality because he doesn't like the continuity of the world and um, the, the spacing of events. He says that things shouldn't exist in, that he doesn't like the temporal organization of the world um, because, because he's crazy, right? <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, he says that the things that happen are just mental habits and that's why we see them that way because they usually happen in this close order. But who's to say that um, something else over here didn't cause this? So someone, someone once compared this to, idea to me and said, an LSD trip, you lose a sense of continuity. If you, for instance, 
uh, accidentally accidentally take LSD and are purchasing purchasing a ticket at the movie counter to maybe a drive-in movie, and then you're you're remembering your interaction with the person at the booth, but then all of a sudden you're laying in the bed of the truck, looking at the end of the movie, and you don't know how you went from grabbing the ticket to watching the credits roll, and you lost that space in between. This uh, this idea you can apply it to David Hume because that's what continuity is. So what really got you to where you are? If events are independent in time, and he doesn't like that spacing of everything that happened between because events are just isolated and they just so happen to occur close together and we like to call that causality but causality in itself doesn't exist because of the idea I just mentioned before. Um, he says that he's very similar to George Berkeley with very senses oriented taste, color, sensations, emotions and uh, he made distinctions between images and impressions so some more vocabulary for david hume is an image for hume is something that's just kind of seen but we don't really like tie tie a lot of emotion to it or um sensory um attachment but an impression an impression is something that like is in your mind it's very strong and impactful mental phenomena in your brain that you're more likely remember an impression and an image is just a faint impression impressions are what matters um moving on let's let's go to Rene Descartes so Rene Descartes famous one-liner I think therefore I am he was a rationalist but um he was always trying to reason sort of similar to the ancient Greeks that to, to derive knowledge. He didn't like to accept anything unless it was 100% proven. And to prove something beyond all doubt is quite difficult. You'll hear this in many videos. Imagine you have a basket full of apples. He believed that you know one of these apples might be rotten so what I'm supposed to do is empty out all the apples, put the basket down, and only put back in the apples that are good because if I leave it the other way and just go about my business, that one spoiled, rot, uh, spoiled apple will rot the rest of the fruit. So in order to know what's good, what's right, what's true, you need to empty out everything and judge it and only put it back once you've determined that it is rationally sound and exists. And when he was doing that, he, he had a very difficult time accepting anything. And he even believed that there was an evil genius in the world put here to deceive us and that's why people do some bad things and what if uh, someone gave him the idea of the evil genius is that saying what if like a cut on your arm was just put there to deceive you to make you think like think that you got it a week ago but in reality you were made five minutes ago it's this five minute theory of the world where what if everything put here that looked old was put here by some evil genius to make us think that we have this past and this history, but we don't because he gave us all these ideas, he gave us a sense, he gave us memories that make us think we got it in the past, but there's no proof to examine the past that to, to, um, to throw out the idea of an evil genius. But he later derived that this, this can't be so, um, God is good, that he's benevolent, and he wouldn't he wouldn't allow an evil genius to, to be put here to deceive us like that. Yeah, I know that I'm not making this up. So he was a rationalist, but that he had to reason that out, you know. He, people if you can't disprove it then I mean it's on the table and that's why he tried really hard to empty out his basket and start putting in things that he knew. And all he knew is that he was doubting all these things. So the one thing he could be sure of is that he's thinking and he's doubting. Therefore, he must exist, or at least his mind must exist. At least his mind must exist. Important, because Rene Descartes was a dualist, meaning his mind does exist, but as far as the body goes, he's still really not too sure about that. Does that, does that exist? I don't know, he knows he's thinking. But he can't really be sure that he, you know, is like alive. 
to some degree. Um, it, he postulated the mind is different from the physical body. Moving on, Spinoza. Okay, Baroque Spinoza. Uh, good luck spelling that. Just remember it's not Espinoza, it's just Spinoza with an S. He was a rationalist and he believed in double aspect monism, otherwise known as uh, monistic pantheism. Monistic pantheism. This fact that uh, the world is made up of one thing, mono, think about that, one. And uh, pantheism everywhere, just um, all encompassing. And the one thing that was everywhere, uh, the one thing, monopantheism, that was everywhere was God. He believed that everything was made out of uh, this a sub substance called God. And it was a very new idea. Spinoza was not popular at his time. He was uh, he was Jewish, and he lived with a in a in a family that did not like his ideas, a society that did not like his ideas. He basically tried to upheave the Bible with his book called The Ethics, and he was excommunicated and forced to leave and later worked his life as a lens grinder um, because people did not want their Bible replaced with this rational book of what the world is, what good is, how to be virtuous, etc. The, the cool thing to get behind Spinoza is that um, there, there are two things, right? Mind, body, we talk about, it says, the mind is different from the body, but everything is kind of composed of this natural God. And so the fact that they're different doesn't even matter anyways, because although they're, although they're different, they're still made of the same things. Sort of like atomists. Atomists think that everything exists out, made out of atoms. So like your chair is made out of atoms. The dog is made out of atoms. And chairs and dogs are different. But if you break it down, they're still made out of atoms. The thing I like about Spinoza and his theories are... Let me think. What, what do I like about Spinoza? Rational thought. Oh, nature. Nature is God for Spinoza. And that um, to understand God is to understand yourself, and you're not supposed to be at the the land. the The law of the land is the same for everyone. You can't just send secret prayers up. And if you have a good understanding of God, you'll understand that He's not going to change anything just for you. He's not just this being who's making decisions that favors you. And he thought it was narcissistic to think that. He thought that everything is God and your purpose in life, you can either be locally concerned or globally concerned with your purpose. And if you're locally concerned, that's the present problems, how you, how problems in your life affect you and how to find solutions to them and use reason to find solutions. But global concerns are more like, how are you gonna pass what you gain in this world down to the next generation and the next generation so we can keep progressing forward as a society. And that's something I really like about um, Spinoza's distinction and that nature is God is what he says. So he has just got this omniscient understanding that um, you just praise the earth and try to find out, to try to find out your place in it by looking at these local and global concerns is trying to find out God because God is giving you your place in the world in the first place by create by having created everything and you and it's your job to find out what that is but he's not going to just tell you you're going to create yourself in the process of knowing him and knowing yourself Immanuel Kant Immanuel Kant is um, from Switzerland he was a rationalist he provided basic social psychology to humans, and he believed we were caught between like government and self like control. Like, who should we let control us, the government, or should we control ourselves? And he he tried to uproot the Bible as well, not the Bible, but religion. He didn't think that ethics belonged in religion. He thinks that people should be good because rationally, it's it's smart to be good, you know. You get a lot of 
benefits and perks being good because you wouldn't want to live in a world of chaos, you should be good. So he rationalized that people should want virtue and they don't need to follow a, a particular religion to achieve it. Religion should be followed for all other things, but not really for this discipline and societal control. So you can allude Kant to some of the early traces of social psychology because he wanted to talk about how things how you could control society, motives, drives, and um, intentions and virtue uh, through, through examining uh, ethics and psychology at large. He was the one with the categorical imperative. Uh, you might have heard that a little bit. Categor categorical imperative is statements that, um, that you have to universalize. So, it's like that the golden rule of do unto others as you would have un them undone to you or something like that so und undo to you saying that any you know what's right and what's wrong and if you don't know what it is just imagine if what you're doing right now if everyone did it would the world operate so if you take um if you take an apple off your neighbor's tree and then he takes a uh, avocado off yours then everyone everyone would have to like kind of lock down their trees because they would never know if someone's going to walk up and take their fruits but maybe if you engage in a social contract maybe every monday i give you two apples you give me two avocados vice versa um then we can start to have some order so he believed in making things categorical imperatives which just means that he wants to make sure that it's good with everyone and it can apply to everyone. He believed in synthetic uh, a priori statements. A prior than I. A priori statements, which is a statement that contains new information about the world. He didn't like the, uh, I guess, like syllogism nature of deductive reasoning. So think about um, a syllogism or just, just a statement that offers no new information about the world. For instance, um, all bachelors are single men. Well, when I said all bachelors, you kind of already knew it meant single men. And then when I finished the statement, it just really, it was redundant. It didn't provide any new information to the world. So he, think, he thought that, that statements called synthetic a priori statements were the only useful knowledge of the world. He believed in interactionism, which is regarding perception and sensations who might stand by the following no one has direct insight into the way of the world and our perception of the world is contingent upon our sensory apparatuses and our senses are limited example what is it like to experience the world as a bat so echolocation so subjective viewpoints um, we all have this ability to what was the word again we, were all, we, we can use empirical knowledge, we can be empiricists, we can observe the world to get knowledge, but we're different people and different species. So the way we use our sensory apparatuses might be different thing to thing. You can think of George Berkeley and Immanuel Kant sharing a lot of the same uh, emphases on observations like this. Kant thought the mind is active and it's not a passive receptor. So Aristotle thought the, the mind was a passive receptor and that it's always on, it's always running, it's giving you information, but only when you recall something, when you recollect on it, Aristotle would say that that's when you have to like really use your reasoning and your, your thoughts to access that sensory information, but your mind is always on, it's a passive receptor. Kant didn't like that. Kant says the mind is active, not passive. And this sort of gives an active mind, it sort of gives birth to ideas of cognitive psychology that our minds are always on, right? Cognitive psychology talks about controlling your thoughts and controlling behaviors, controlling moods, the way you think, influences, can influence pathology, can, inf can help you get better. Think about cognitive behavioral therapy. So Immanuel Kant, categorical imperatives, mind is active, use your senses, um, all that good stuff. Let's move past those fools 
and talk a little bit about Brentano. Okay, Brentano uh, came up with ACT Psychology, and that's not the new way of uh, acceptance commitment therapy of psychology that you know today, but ACT Psychology says that actions have intentionality. So it's kind of just using your, your brain to say that when you want when you want something the object itself um, has some qualities to it of the act it's it's giving it's giving um some importance to the object which is the weird part about it so let me put it this way we can experience a variety of stimulation simultaneously but they can only create one unified experience. So for example, if I'm on the beach, relaxing, listening to some nice music, uh, having a glass of wine maybe, and watching a sunset, I am experiencing many different stimuli, such as the sun, the music, the wine, the relaxation, the babe by my side. But the thing is that it's not all, I don't only boom music, boom girl, boom sun, boom tan, the, and keep going back and forth between all of them. I'm amalgamating them, throwing them all together and creating one unified experience. He would say that, okay, so wine plus music plus sunset, one plus one plus one equals four, okay? He wouldn't say it's, it's all those parts it equals that because they're not isolated. They, they form together to make something new and greater, right? So it's, it's like the sum of the parts is, the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. That confusing thing that we hear all the time, right? Uh, he studied mental phenomena. This is Brentano still. And he said the mind is active. It's chosen and future oriented and not automatic. So this is what I'm talking about when I was talking about the objects and I didn't really put it very clearly, but now I'm ready to, now that I have this little note um mental activity is active chosen and future oriented not automatic he noted that every act always refers to or intends act is intentionality it intends um something outside of itself so i didn't just reach for the coffee i reached for the coffee because uh i had a purpose of drinking the liquid in it because i'm thirsty so i have an intention and an object which i intend um Sometimes it may be for another act like I may be acting in a way so I can get something else later so it's sort of like you can think of that chain of events of Things aren't random, but things are intentional So that objects are part of the act itself because you did it for a, a, a reason Let's touch on I think that might be all I want to do right now. Um, <laughs> James, Let's touch a little bit on Watson. We'll finish off with Watson, a behaviorist. So before Watson, it's important to note that um, some other stuff happened, right? So we went we went, we talked about Kant, we talked about Brentano next, and then we should know that uh, William no, no, Wundt. Wundt was the German like granddaddy of psychology, but you can look up William Wundt on your own. He believed in voluntarism, voluntarism that Things, should, things in the lab, he studied the lab extensively, sensation, perception, he defined psychology as, um, he, wanted, he looked at consciousness, he thought that that was very important to investigate. He had a tridimensional theory, thinking that people act out of pain or pleasure, strain or relaxation, or excitation and quiescence. That's Wundt's three-dimensional theory. It's a lot more on Wundt, and then equal, equally important to Wundt, who brought psychology to the United States, and that is William James. I believe it's William James. It's James for sure. 
but um, he was a radical empiricist, not like most of these guys are, using your senses. Um, he took a model that stood by multiple levels of analysis. He might be termed um, a stru structuralist, functionalist. He might, you might hear that he's a, a functionalist. James functionalism. Yeah, you might hear that he's a functionalist because right after structuralism, the act of psychology is saying that we have these brain structures and they must be doing something. He wanted to find out the function. That's where Wundt's laboratory kind of paved the way of let's start experimenting with these functions, with these structures. And then James is like, yeah, let's, we're experimenting with these structures. So let's break off from structuralism and form functionalism. Although he kind of renounces his role in functionalism because he's multi-model. He believes that you should use multiple levels of analysis to gain knowledge about the world. And what do I like about James? It is William James, there we go. Um, he believed in people having different types of self. He thought that you had a material self, a social self, a spiritual self, and then you have self-esteem. Self-esteem is like sort of your accomplishments to your expectations. It's a ratio that, that's gonna create your esteem, clearly. Spiritual self, is kind of like your religious self. Your spiritual self is, you can think of evaluating and judging your behavior, um, sort of like a super ego. And then what else do we have? Social self. Social self is the self you are like in different environments. Okay, so depending on where you are, how you act. And then material self, is everything you own, including your body, including your friends, including your clothing, just everything that you kind of have a link to in that manner. So for summing up James, um, yeah, so those were the sense of selves. But if we want to sum up James, he was a functionalist, an empiricist, uh, he believed in the cells, material, social, spiritual, self-esteem. He believed uh, science needs multiple levels of analysis and there's not just one correct way. And he believed that people had a stream of thought with primary and secondary thoughts and that the stream was always changing. So um, that we always we have new ideas and our mind is just always thinking and it's on. And the primary memories are the things that are like most close in our, our memory. So maybe where you just came from, um, something that's primary and quick immediate, present memories. And secondary memories are things that like, what was your first car, okay? that's a, It's a memory that you have, but it's in the past. It's not actively available. And um, if you wanna study that sort of things, look, look into William James, look into um, uh, Wundt as well. So I hope you gained a lot of bullet point information. I sort of went into far more depth than I had intended, but that could be a good thing, right? Anyone with exams can tell you that it's not bad. Um, I try to do this re recap at the end. So let me just get to it. Knowledge John Corsair.